episode of The Tapestry. I am Dr. Francois Booker Drew, and this is a show designed for you to learn from the amazing lessons of incredible women sharing their narratives. Our stories have so much power in them, and as we listen to the stories of others, it empowers us to know that our stories, too, are important and that they matter. And so I am elated on this episode. And I say that every episode because I mean it, that these are incredible women that I'm just honored to know and call friend. And so today you are going to be in for a treat as well with Dr. Emily Newsom. <laughs> Emily just got her doctorate degree, and we're going to talk about that today because I'm so proud of my friend and what she's done. But she uses words, y'all. This is a wordsmith extraordinaire. And she believes that words are the creative force of the universe. She is a Christian life coach based in Dallas, Texas, and her practice focuses on helping clients use in tandem with the word of God to accomplish their goals and to build richer and more fulfilling lives. She says, when you write it, read it, say it, and see it, it will surely come to pass. She is a lifelong student with a deep respect for education. She has studied at the University of Chicago, DePaul, Case Western Reserve, and American Public University, Texas Bible Institute and Seminary, and some other schools. Emily likes school. She has two bachelor's degrees, a master's, and a PhD in theological studies. She's got training in a number of areas. She's an ordained minister, and she is also a writer. She's been recognized for her achievement in the arts, for her spoken word work, and she, in addition to all of this schooling and helping people, she has time to volunteer and has inspired women to excel because of the writing and work that she does. And so I will not go into a lot of detail about her writing because y'all, we will be here for a long time going through all the works that she has submitted, but know that this is someone who uses words in a way to change people's lives. And so with that said, I am honored to introduce you to Dr. Emily Newsom. Hey, Em. Oh, sweetheart. Goodness gracious. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear from you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. Um, well, yeah. You know, you know, I always had to, to bring my girl on. Emily and I go way back when she first moved to Dallas. And I'll let you tell that story of how you got to Dallas <laughs> and what you um, have done since that. What what made you come to Dallas? Talk about and, that. Um, I was a single mother with four children. Um, had been through a very difficult divorce. I am a woman of faith. You probably you said that already. Um, and I I was really seeking some direction for what my future should be. And I got a phone call at my job from someone I hadn't heard from in 10 years who said, hey, I'm about to start this project and I need you to move to Texas to help me get it off the ground. And I said, you're crazy. I don't even know how you got to Texas. I'm not coming to Texas. <laughs> But as I continue to, to pray, um, I felt led to, to, to move here. And so um, the move here with four children was a true act of faith. Um, there was no job when I got here. We stayed in a house that had been converted into a church that we put some mattresses on the floor and slept on the floor for a period of time. And within a week, I had a job interview and I got to meet you, Miss Dr. <laughs> Booker Drew. <laughs> and I have to talk about um, the amazing things that you have done for our family since we've been here. Uh, we moved here in July and 
in August, you had arranged for a scholarship for all four of my children to a school they would otherwise not have been able to attend. Um, and that's the kind of support that you have given to not just me, but to so many others over the years. And so I just want to take this opportunity to publicly say thank you for all that you do to encourage, especially women of color in this community and across the nation. I know. So thank you. you don't make me cry today. <laughs> um, I, we are not going to do that because we typically will have each other in tears. It's true. I, it, 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 is, it, it has been such a blessing to watch you flourish and looking at the role of faith in your journey has been critical. Talk about that because it wasn't just getting your four kids who are now adults, your grandma, and getting them off to, to being contributing successful human beings, but how has faith helped you in those times that I know of that were dark and dismal and you still got through? Talk about that. Faith is my foundation. That that's the that's it in a nutshell. Um, I was literally raised by faith. My mother's name was Faith, and my mother had um, a series of events in her life that helped her to understand what that faith looked like in practice. My mother was paralyzed from the neck down when she was 17 years old. The doctors told her mother that if she lived through it, she would never walk. And she had a family member who she said would sit by her bed and tell her to learn the meaning of her name. She did that. <laughs> um, wow. And she imparted that faith to me in the way that she lived life. My mother never made more than $10,000 a year. And yet... Um, I was at the opera every year. I was at the ballet every year. I was at the symphony every year. I took cello lessons from the second chair of the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra. Wow. Yes, that's faith. That is faith. <laughs> um, and so faith is all I know. Faith is all I know. Because of her example, um, I knew that I always had a source when nobody else could see one. And that was a, a supernatural force. Uh, I'm a devout Christian, not in the ways that uh, many people talk about Christianity, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, <laughs> um, but I know that there is, there is strength, there is resource available. I have learned what it means to operate in humility. I have come to understand some things about servant leadership um, and all of those things. Oh, forgiveness. Let me not leave out forgiveness. Um, and that was huge for me because um, I was in relationships that would have made me a victim of domestic violence. Instead, I'm now an overcomer I'm not just a survivor, I'm an overcomer. And I know that it was faith that allowed me to move to that level. And that's what I try to share with others. You've written a, as a part of this work called Sanction Misogyny and <laughs> focusing on how the church condones a culture of domestic violence and yeah. what we can do to change that. Talk a bit more about the involvement or lack of involvement of the church in this and what you have experienced and women you've worked with have experienced in that space. Goodness me. Um, I will start with my first ordination when I'm standing before the board and the questions that I get are, what happens if um, you are asked to preach at a church and the pastor won't let you in the pulpit? Wow. I'm just positive that the men <laughs> who were being ordained didn't get that question. Um, but it still happens today. In 2020, mm -hmm. that still happens. 
Um, and my answer was that I understand I was called to preach. So if I have to do that in the restroom, at the bus stop, in the kitchen, where, wherever that is, then my goal is to allow the word of God to go forth with power. Uh, I don't think that was the answer they were <laughs> expecting. Um, but I know women who have been assigned as pastors who have had to take on absolutely every role in the church from cleaning the bathrooms to serving the food. Wow. Um, and, I, and I have been uh, in a ministerial role in a church similar to that, where I had to come in, clean the bathroom, the praise and worship leader didn't show up. So do that. Um, after the collection was taken, count the money and then go, go and make sure that people get their refreshments after service. Um, I had everything except the key to the church. <laughs> wow. And it still happens. It still happens. And it's unfortunate because what that means is that the gifts and talents that are in half of the population and quite frankly, more than half of the church yes. are being squandered, if you will. We have such a rich tapestry of gifts and talents and when we're not able to use those in the church um, especially for people who've grown up in the church the question becomes well how can I really use them if I can't use them here so what I've discovered in my research is that most of this demonization of the feminine is a cultural construct yes when you go back and look at some of the scriptures that are typically used to keep women in a place of servility and all of that, um, you find that they have been misinterpreted from their original intention. Again, because of you know cultural constructs um, built on traditions that support patriarchal institutions and androcentric conceptions of how the world should be. And so what the church can do, first of all, is go back, forget what you think you know, pray before you read it, and find out what the scripture really means. And if we teach it from that perspective, uh, we'll open up a lot of doors for for the entire body, and I, and I believe the entire world, to be able to move forward on some of these issues. I love it. You should see me over here snapping because I and, and, and clapping because I had to correct someone who said, well, women can't speak in the church. And they referenced the scripture of Paul. Mm -hmm. And mine was that's a cultural context because the women were talking and making noise. And so that was not to say that moving forward, women were not supposed to speak in the church. That was for that particular group of women. And so often the word has been used to not only uplift, but to oppress communities of people. Yes. And th that includes women. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I haven't even gotten into the intersectionality of race and ethnicity. I'm just talking about women. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the premise of this work is that um, these misinterpretations of what scripture really says about us, um, and when I say us, I mean people <laughs> in general, mm -hmm. um, is that these structures very silently, very quietly, and sometimes out in the open,